Good morning, everyone. My name is Cristal Mojica. I'm the Senior Program Manager for the Digital Equity Initiative here at Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation. Uh, through this initiative, we have been working to advance equitable solutions designed to close the digital divide in all its forms. Um, on behalf of Michelson Philanthropies and our co-chairs, uh, Dr. Gary K. Michelson and Alia Michelson, we thank you for joining us today for the 11th installment of Connecting California, um, Solving the Digital Divide. Uh, this is our virtual learning series uh, that we've had running for a few years now. Um, this series has significantly focused on some of the longest standing um, and historically intractable problems that are hampering the advancements in digital equity. Today, everything from disinvestment in mun municipal broadband infrastructure to systemic and digital redlining. With recent leaps in generative AI technology, we've seen the emergence of the potential for a new frontier of the digital divide, an AI divide. So that's why we're having this conversation today. Um, as a quick example, the Pew Research Center found that among infrequent users of the internet, only 6% had a material grasp on AI topics, adding to the growing concerns that those already on the wrong side of the divide will be left behind at an increasing rate in classrooms, in the workforce, and beyond. The exclusion of these vulnerable populations from participation in AI ecosystems also means that their needs, their priorities, and voices may be largely absent in the subsequent training and evolution of AI models, perpetuating a cycle of discrimination and exclusion. Um, as te AI technology accelerates during this inflection point, it's critical for communities, policymakers, e equity advocates, and tech companies to be thoughtful and deliberate in steering these transformative technologies towards closing the divide rather than widening it. So this is what we hope to address through our conversation and presentation today. So we'll be kicking off with a brief presentation from one of our panelists to lay the groundwork for the conversation and then moving into the panel conversation. So before we do that, I'd like to thank our longstanding partners in the series, including California Community Foundation, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, SoCal Grantmakers, and our organizing partner for this specific session, Microsoft Philanthropies. Um, Linda, our partner in digital inclusion and community engagement at Microsoft couldn't participate today, uh, but she is in the audience and she wanted to share some words on behalf of um, her organization. So Microsoft is pleased and humbled to collaborate with Michelson 20MM Foundation, uh, CCF, USC, and JFF Labs uh, for this conversation on AI. Uh, we believe in responsible AI as a company. Um, AI is becoming more and more a part of our lives and yet some of our laws are lagging behind. We recognize our responsibility to act and believe that we need to work towards ensuring AI systems are responsible by design. By listening and learning from our communities, we can be a part of the future of AI. So again, I, I'd like to thank you for being here today, and we hope that this conversation can both illuminate and spark further discussion on the opportunities and challenges of AI and digital equity. So now I'll move into introducing our speakers who will be joining us for the panel today after the presentation. And Jen, oh yeah, thank you. So first off, from the digital equity advocacy and grassroots efforts perspective, we have Natalie Gonzalez, who is the deputy director of the Digital Equity Initiative um, for California Community Foundation, and also leads uh, digital, the Digital Equity Los Angeles Coalition. Um, the Digital Equity Initiative at CCF is a multi-year project that will seed a digital equity movement in Los Angeles County with the power and capacity to successfully advocate for fast, reliable, and affordable broadband for, for all Angelinos. Uh, prior to working in the digital equity space, Natalie worked within the Public Policy and Civic Engagement Department at CCF, supporting strategic partnerships, advocacy, uh, local and state initiatives, uh, specifically the COVID-19 Community Health Project. We also have with us today, Alex Swartzel, um, who is uh, amazing and leading workforce development um, as managing director of insights uh, at JFF Labs. Um, JFF Labs New Insights Practice is a growing team that helps decision makers across the education to career landscape understand and prepare for the emerging trends and technologies and innovations shaping the future of work and learning. Uh, JFF Labs rapid insights process and a transformative Trends research agenda focuses on core areas impacting the future of work and learning. 
one that includes climate resilience, lifelong learning, the metaverse, AI, aerospace, robotics, and other fields that emerge as the market evolves. Um, Alex is also leading the launch of JFF's new Center for Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Work. So we're very lucky to have both Alex and Natalie. And then to round out the panel, uh, we have Dr. Eric Rice, who's the co-founder for the Center for AI in Society and is a professor um, at the School of Social Work uh, at USC. Um, it's, it's a joint venture of the USC Suzanne Dorak Peck School of Social Work and the USC Bitterby School of Engineering. So having served as a USC faculty member since 2009, Dr. Rice specializes in social network science and theory. In addition to community-based research, his primary focus is on youth experiencing homelessness and how issues of social network influence may affect risk-taking behaviors and resilience. So for several years now, Dr. Rice has worked with colleagues, colleague Milind Tambe to merge social work science and AI, seeking novel solutions to major social problems such as homelessness and HIV. So with that, you're done hearing from me for a few minutes. Um, I invite Dr. Rice to uh, share with you all some foundational uh, AI um, research. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for that introduction. I'm excited to be a part of this panel and to share a little bit about AI and some thoughts about uh, AI and equity and ethics. Um, so let me swear I run an AI center. Okay, even though I fumble with technology. Um, okay, so... Um, I'm Eric Rice. I'm a, a you know a professor at the uh, USC Suzanne, Dvor Suzanne Dvorak Peck School of Social Work. So I am a, a sociologist by training. I am a social work faculty member for the last uh, 15 years. And uh, about 10 years ago, I started working with engineers around um, uh, AI and how we might use AI in social work research. And so I have some... Uh, experience with, you know, what is AI even? And I, I thought it was great that there was this initial uh, fact from the the Pew um, that had been shared, which is that of those who are, you know, marginally connected to the internet, that only 6% have a, a material grasp of even what AI and AI issues are. And I think that that is maybe even just the beginning of where we need to start, which is thinking about you know, what is AI and 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 how is AI playing into our lives and what are some of the key issues around equity? So I'll try to keep my remarks to about 10 minutes or so. Um, and so we can get rolling into this really interesting conversation, but use this as an opportunity to, to do some uh, you know, settings of the stage. So one thing I want to mention is that I'm a bit of a Luddite. So this is a, a picture of me preparing to give talks. Um, you know, it's like I'm taking note. I take notes with a pen still. Um, both me and my cat, uh, Krishna, really like vinyl records. Uh, we don't like uh, streaming services so much. So I'm not a technology um, apologist, nor am I necessarily one of these people who thinks that technology is going to save the world. My interest is more that we think about technology in thoughtful ways, and we think about how technology can be used to address social problems and social inequities and not exacerbate them. And that's really what I've been trying to do in my in my center for the last um, several years. So, you know, I started this center back in 2016 um, with uh, collaborators of mine in the School of Engineering here at USC. And the focus of our center is really to collaborate with communities to create a more just, healthy, and sustainable world. So what does all of that look like? Well, I think one of the things that's really helpful to start thinking about is what is AI and what is not AI? So I think these days, especially with generative AI and all of the hype that's surrounded it, we're once again in a place where people are thinking about AI as being very scary. So it's uh, a lot of our thoughts are about um, oh, so this is the 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 my my center. Let me just say one last thing. You know, the idea is to try to bring engineering, social work, and community partners together. So okay, so what is this? So I think AI, we think about it as being this, like we have 
killer robots that are coming to take our jobs. They're going to take over the world. And that's probably not something that we need to be worried about quite yet. Although it feels like with every advance, you know, things get a little bit closer to, you know, the, the world of, of the Terminator. So I, what I want to suggest instead is like, let's think about like, what is AI in our real day-to-day -day lives these days, right? So one thing is predictive, um, predictive modeling, right? So we do a lot of, um, we interact all the time with AI technologies that are guessing uh, what it is that we want, right? So this banner ad has been put in front of you on your social media. There's probably a predictive analytic that's under that's you know undergirding that. Um, when you go to do something as simple as a Google search and you and it you know halfway through you you writing out your search term, it fills in the possibilities where you want to go. This is again, we are using AI to try to guess at uh, where we're trying to go. So we're mining data to to make predictions. Um, I'll talk about how this can start to be really scary when it starts to be applied to the quote unquote real world. It seems not so threatening when it's like, well, do I want to be typing in what is artificial intelligence or artificial selection or articulation or what is article 50? I mean, if if, if the computer gets that wrong, it's not such a big deal. If it gets it wrong and we're talking about, you know, um, you know, bail bonds, it's a big deal. Um, also, you know, another thing that, you know, is AI in our daily lives is chatbots, right? So basically all the time these days, if you are going online and you are trying to, you know, you're doing a, some sort of help feature on, you know, customer service, you are probably not talking to a human being. You are probably talking to a chatbot, and these things could actually be leveraged, you know, to you know for good. So I mean, we might think about doing some things that are positive with these chatbots, you know, helping people talk about stigmatizing issues, um, helping you know having social service connections that are available twenty four hours a day when we can't necessarily always have you know um, you know people on call twenty four hours a day. But um, that's another spot. Chat GPT is another thing that we really need to think a lot about. So um, generative AI is becoming more and more frequent. So, um, you know, we're creating art that is that is created by, by computers. We are creating text. You know, we're creating, you know, um, ad copy, you know, that you read these days. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's everywhere. I think another kind of, of AI that we should think about a lot in terms of you know, how it impacts equity is also um, decision aids and algorithms that are helping make decisions for us. So I think I don't know that people are necessarily always aware of the fact that, uh, again, something like Google Maps or Waze is also a sort of AI. So we're, we're, we're mining information about traffic. We're mining, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the, you know, hundreds of thousands of possible routes that you could take from, you know, LAX to USC campus, for example, and we want to know what are the, what is the best, most efficient way to get there, and maybe we want a couple of options. So it's giving us a couple of, a couple of possibilities. There are other AIs that are, that are also complex sort of optimizing systems. You know, you can think about things like, um, you know, Uber or Lyft, where we're trying to match riders to drivers. And here we have a little bit less of the human, uh, you know, uh, like Google, it's a decision aid, right? Like I, I ask for possible, you know, ideas, and then it gives me choices. And I decide which one of those I want to follow, you know, things like, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft are a little more automated, you know, it, it, it's, it's assigning riders and drivers, and we can you know, potentially refuse if you're a driver, but, you know, for the most part, you, know, you kind of get what you get. So why do we care about this stuff from an equity standpoint? Well, you know, oh, one last thing. So sometimes people talk a lot about, um, you know, what is statistics and what is machine learning, right? So what is this, you know, aside from generative AI, you know, and I think a lot more people understand what statistics are than they do what machine learning is. And so, you know, machine learning is very similar to statistics, except that it usually uses data that have 
where we've got lots more observations and it's doing it in a way where the actual mechanics of how the decisions are being made are not as transparent and also where the goal is 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 different so like when we're talking about statistics we often want to understand like what are the relationships between data like we almost think about scatter plots right but when we're talking about machine learning all we really care about is accuracy so what what we really want to just know is is this a more accurate um uh is this a more accurate model or a less accurate model and you know kind of the why of how we got there so like the relationships between variables like is this curved is this a straight line we we don't necessarily care as much about and that can be a little bit scary when it starts to be applied to the real world so now let's talk about that so this black box in ai we often talk about some of these solutions as being black box and so some of the most popular sorts of AI that are used to make decisions are these machine learning techniques that, that are referred to as like neural networks or random forests or support vector machines. And what's scary about these things is that they are, they are these black box, which means that we don't know why the decisions are being made. We might understand here's the data that we're inputting, and we understand that it's saying Yes, this is a this is a, a likely outcome or, or an unlikely outcome. Now, a lot of these things are maybe not so scary when we're talking about an algorithm that's going to tell us, is this a picture of a cat or a dog, for example, right? Like this was some of the stuff that I was seeing people developing with these black box things 10 years ago. And it was like, yeah, big deal. Like if it's wrong, it's not a big deal. It's cool that you could train a model to tell you that that's a picture of a cat versus that's a picture of a dog. That ends up being more, a little bit more threatening when you're like, this is facial recognition software now. And is it accurate for, um, for minority uh, populations, especially people with darker skin tones? And then what does that mean? And so these predictive analytic models become particularly scary when they're black box, when they're making decisions about our lives. So one of the examples that I think gained a lot of notoriety several years ago and is still sort of brought up as, a, as an example of a bad use case is this software called Compass that was being implemented to make bail bond decisions. And it was one of these machine learning driven black box um, decision making uh, tools where you where people were being assigned a score based on a bunch of data that was being mined from administrative data surveys that people were given and, and a few other things and then risk scores were being given to folks and what was happening in this because these algorithms were designed probably by well-intentioned people but who weren't really thinking carefully through issues about equity and issues of you know um discrimination and issues of disparities that exist in our in our society what it turned out was that these algorithms were highly biased so that people with um in some cases much less um troubling pasts were scored much higher um uh if they were black than if they were white and you can go look up this if you haven't heard about this case before, but the last thing that I'll, I'll leave you with is just a couple of minutes of my thoughts about how in my center we've been trying to say, well, this is something that's happening. How can we do something about this and what can be done to make this, to, to deal with this? So AI, if used well, can actually be used to address social inequities, not exacerbate them, as was the case with the bail bonds algorithm. So I've been working on a project for the last uh, several years with the Los Angeles Housing Service Authority, where we are trying to address systemic racism in uh, housing, uh, it, housing and homelessness issues in Los Angeles. So just to give you a context, in LA, 9% of the population of LA is black, whereas 30% of people experiencing homelessness in 2023 were black. Uh, so there's a huge disparity in just in terms of how many people are impacted who are black in terms of experiencing homelessness. 
And for those of you living in California, you're probably painfully aware of how awful our homelessness situation is. You know, about 75,000 people uh, a, a night experience homelessness in Los Angeles. So one of the issues here is that we have not enough resources to go around. So one of the things that we want to do, like with the bail bonds idea, is HUD has asked communities to try to figure out who the most vulnerable people are and to prioritize them for housing resources first. When you do this, one of the things that you can introduce as soon as you have a scoring system, um, and this is not even an AI driven scoring system, this is just a paper and pencil scoring, scoring system, is that you can introduce racial bias. So what we've done in this work is that we've tried to understand, we've tried to learn where bias is and then understanding that race bias is something that we want to address. We've been trying to help to create a prediction model that is less biased and also then a recommendation system sort of like Google Maps that is that is taking race equity into account. And I'll just share this one last slide with you and I'll walk you through for two seconds to sort of show what the possibilities of this are and then I promise I'm done and we can get onto the conversation, which is that this is what's happening in the status quo system in in LA. And that what you can see is that there's a certain amount of racial inequity that's going on, and this is the status quo um, as as we as we actually this is uh, uh, as we as as we look at these are two different versions of the status quo. If we were to actually use a first come first serve system in in LA, your probability of exiting homelessness if you're white actually goes up quite a bit. If you're black, it goes it's even worse than the status quo um, allocation system that we've got. But also simply using machine learning unthinkingly, which is what this opt is, it's an optimization algorithm, which is basically we want to design a system where we are housing the, you know, the most people as quickly as possible. What actually that ends up doing is it also, while it might serve more people than the status quo system, because it's, it's, it's solving some problems, it also has a quite a bit of racial inequity that, that are created here. And this is somewhat like the compass system, right? It seems efficient and great, but as soon as you start to interrogate it, you actually find out that there's racial bias in, involved in it. However, if you know going into it that racial bias is something that you want to address, you can actually design the algorithm such that it is, um, at least from a statistical significance standpoint, it is not, um, it is, it is no longer um, one that is, that is racially biased. Um, to get it perfectly exactly across the board, one is almost impossible unless you just have a strict quota system, which is not strictly speaking legal. And so, you know, the best you can do with this is to get it to be um, at least negligible in terms of its, uh, it, the differences. And so I just want to introduce this as an idea of it's not that all AI is always necessarily bad. You can actually design systems, and these are my computer science colleagues that designed this particular system where you can where you can address some of these things. And there's a gazillion papers if you want, and I can share that if you send me an email later. So here's my email address. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And I hope that that gave us at least some thoughts about AI and equity and didn't make things worse. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. I hope it provokes many questions for the Q&A portion. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Rice, for laying the groundwork there for this conversation. Um, and thank you for sharing those very specific um, examples and statistics you know, as they relate to, to Los Angeles and the, the communities that we're deeply embedded in. And so with that, I would like to invite um, all three of our panelists to, to join us um, on camera uh, to kick off the conversation. Um, and we'll just, we'll jump right into it. So you know, how does, and I'll, I'll start with Natalie, maybe you could kick us off. Um, how does AI currently intersect in your field of work uh, of advocacy and, and being deeply embedded in community? Um, what are the big questions that you're asking yourselves as you do your work? And, and maybe you can share what the greatest challenge or priority that you've, you've come across so far is as it relates to, to AI and digital equity. Yeah, thanks so much, Crystal, and thank you, Professor Rice, for the presentation. Um, you know, AI, I think, for the space that I work in is centered in community and advocacy. Um, so I think for this purpose of what we're on coming from is from the community standpoint of who's really gained access to um, programs like AI and who has the opportunity, and then who are also the folks that are being redlined and having the uh, the 
disparity in the impacts that we see from redlining. Um, so I think just for the purpose of this conversation, just wanted to also highlight the National Digital Inclusion Alliance NDIA's definition around digital equity and rounding just centering it on uh, communities that have information and technology and capacity needed to fully participate in society. Um, and we know that for us, in terms of the community work that we do, we see um, components of redlining with price disparities when it comes to internet services. And we know that internet providers use market research and various algorithms to uh, really dictate where their investments are gonna be for fiber networks. Um, and we know that communities that obviously have, uh, that are lower income, communities of, of color are the ones affected um, most greatly where they have a historical disinvestment in fiber networks, which ultimately end up um, causing interruption in services, lack of access to broadband, higher prices for broadband packages. Um, so the, the list just goes on, but I think for this conversation, really focusing on the redlining aspects of where providers are providing investment in really comes from an algorithmic um, standpoint. Thank you, Natalie. And Alex, do you, do you wanna jump in? And I'm really excited uh, you know, to hear also the, some of the research that you've been working on. Sure. Um, thanks so much again, Crystal, and, and everybody at Michelson and Microsoft for having us. Um, it's great to be with everybody today. So at, at Jobs for the Future, as our name might suggest, we are focused on advancing um, economic equity and inclusion through transforming the education and workforce systems in the United States. Um, our North Star goal, which we just announced earlier this year, is to connect 75 million Americans facing barriers to advancement to quality jobs, because we know what a power powerful lever a quality job can be, one that pays sufficiently, that gives benefits and flexibility and opportunities for advancement um, to create economic mobility and opportunity for people all across the country. Um, and so within the auspices of the Center for Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Work, we are really drilling in deeply on the way in which AI can accelerate equitable economic advancement through the lens especially of both the question of quality jobs. Um, and how AI is being incorporated into our workforce and education systems. So um, some of what we've been working on, we will have, as you mentioned, Crystal, some research coming out in the next couple of months that starts to lay out our point of view about how, how AI is going to implicate jobs and skills. Um, I'm sure we'll get into it in much more depth um, later in the call, but the headline really is um, when we think about how we can position workers and learners across the country um, to make sure that they and the skills and the capabilities and knowledge that they bring into the workforce and into training opportunities that position them for quality jobs. First of all, that we need to make sure that everybody has a degree of foundational AI literacy, that that 6% number goes way, way up to make sure that everybody understands how this technology is going to reshape really all of our jobs, as well as the way that we all work and learn and even live. Um, but also to make sure that we're continuing to double down on the uniquely human skills, sometimes called durable skills or soft skills, um, that we see pop up to varying degrees in really every job, and that actually AI will help to elevate or augment the use of AI will actually, we think, increase the degree to which humans use some of those kinds of soft or durable skills, um, which we think is a really positive and potentially powerful note for what it looks like for jobs to evolve over time in a way that continues to keep humans at the center and creates opportunities for more and more people um, in a way that's truly equitable. Um, so I'll leave it there for now. Um, there's, there's a lot that we're working on and thinking on, but those are some of the highlights. Dr. Rice, I know you just gave your presentation, but did you have anything you wanted to share in terms of um, current challenges in, in your kind of day-to-day -day work or yeah, the priorities that you have yeah sure i mean I, th I think i think we as i maybe alluded to at the last few slides are really interested in issues around fairness and bias and and how ai especially when you are using um the the, the universe of big data you know we are we are in a in a in a in a time when all of our public institutions and social service institutions are collecting a massive amount of data when we interface with those institutions. Um, and there are, to a certain extent, inherently biases that come into play when 
our public institutions engage with folks, right? So for example, just simple things like the fact that, you know, children from impoverished backgrounds, children from, you know, minor, minority communities are much more likely to be in the child welfare system at all, right? These are, these are not unbiased data. And if we're going to use these data down the road to try to help us to deliver services better and more efficiently, which is, I think, some of the, the promise that AI holds out for us, we need to be thinking very carefully about how do we engage with those systems, meaning child welfare agencies, and how do we engage with those data, the administrative data that gets collected, and make sure that we are actually helping and not creating new sources of harms and new kinds of, uh, you know, now digitally created inequities to that would be kind of compounding the already, you know, kind of massive pile of social inequities that we already see. And and I think that the the bail bonds case that was very famous is sort of a a great example of the what we don't want to be replicating. And I think that in in our work we we're trying to think about how do we tackle problems like helping systems figure out how to allocate homeless you know resources to homeless individuals and do it in a way that's helping not hurting um and i think that it's a very interesting space because i think there needs to be more people in, involved who are not necessarily technologists but who are what we would think of more as people from the social sciences space, from the ethics space, from the community advocacy space, who are partners at the table with people who are developing the technology because the it needs to be, the, you know, the, the technical solutions are probably going to be designed by an engineer, but the specifications of those technical solutions need to come in part from the community and in part from other experts who have a history of working with community and elevating those community voices. And I think that that's what's great about this conversation is I think it's very much trying to be that kind of conversation. And I, my experience of working with people in computer science is that they're very open to that kind of conversation. So I'm excited about this. Um, yeah, th thank you for sharing that. And actually just to piggyback off of that, and this was not one of the, the prepared questions, but um, I saw the, uh, enthusiastic nodding from Alex and Natalie. Uh, how are you all um, incorporating um, communities and some of these other stakeholders uh, into into your work or into your conversations to to ensure that they're part of the conversation as well? I'll just say briefly that you know, especially as we embark on on deeper work on AI, because we we really are are still quite new to this space. We just kicked this off in the summer. We are really eager to include voices, not just from the leaders of the workforce and education institutions that that we serve, but also workers and learners themselves. Um, especially when you think about generative AI, which tools like ChatGPT and Bard and others that are so accessible that any one of us can pick them up and play around with them when we have access to the fundamental technology that allows for that, which is a key question for us today. Um, that creates a real explosion of potential innovation, different use cases and so forth. Um, and so I think a lot of what the, the field writ large is looking for today are examples of what people are doing, how workers are using it in their day-to-day -day lives, um, what new you know, applications are being developed or what new ideas people are coming up with. Um, and that's often the voice that's missing when you just start with the higher level picture. And so we are, we're only just beginning to start to dig into that. Um, but that perspective is going to be really, really critical um, in no small part as a way to continue to double down on the need for workers and learners, especially to have real agency about how they use AI tools, um, and how their use of those kinds of applications can help reshape the way in which they work and learn. Yeah, and I think to Professor Rice's point around community being at the table with the engineers, you know, we saw this um, most recently with the middle mile and uh, federal funding accounts that's coming down to California around broadband infrastructure. It's a really exciting time for California being um, kind of leading the charge and what is digital equity and what is access for all for when it comes to internet. Um, so there's just tons of money coming down the pipeline from the federal government 
that really has lasting consequences on these communities where infrastructure build outs will be lasting 20 to 40 years, which will either widen the, the, the digital divide or close it. Um, and so the data of where these dollars are being allocated to is relying on these funding allocations of these maps. And the maps are being dictated by engineers and different data sets that really highlight the disparities of where communities need access to internet and where the infrastructure needs to be updated. Um, so when we talk about an algorithm standpoint, it's a very small subset, but the lasting consequences of the impacts and the outcomes of where these build outs are happening are have direct consequences to communities of color. Um, you know, they use various data sets that highlight, for instance, one of the maps that was released show the area of Beverly Hills and Pacific Palisades needing the most updated infrastructure because they, you know, had maybe one or two providers. But when communities looked at these maps and we started doing the analysis around um, what the actual needs are, you know that those data sets are actually wrong. Um, so it was up to community to provide that input and that voice to elevate the stories that were happening in real time. Um, and we got those those maps changed and they changed the algorithm. They included various data sets um, and we questioned it. So I think having community voice at the table that elevates their lived experiences um, is a really powerful component when it comes to advocacy and making sure that digital discrimination is being talked about and not just um, in an academia standpoint, but also in real life. And how is that relatable to, um, to the community? So we've heard uh, data sets come up a few times now. Um, can, let's talk about you know how how representative and equitable is is the data that AI uh, tools are relying on right now, and how is how is your work thinking about this equity challenge and and the ownership of this data? Um, do you you know do you have any examples of some of who is doing it right? Like is anyone getting it right in terms of best practices for? Um, making sure that their data uh, is e equitable. Um, Alex, maybe you want to uh, take this one on? I can start and then would be curious, um, both Dr. Rice and, and Natalie, what you both think. Um, I think this is a big question on a couple of different dimensions. You know, one is obviously just core access to, you know, to technology and to data. But the, the point that you just made, Crystal, about who shows up in that data and when and how, you know, obviously, you know, Dr. Rice gave us a great example of when the Compass system is mining data sets that are reflective of a, of a biased society. Um, and thus, if you are just programming the world to act as or an algorithm to act in a way that replicates the inequitable society that currently exists, you get more inequity, which is not great. Um, but some of the things that we're, again, just starting to think about in our work are other questions about how do you start to level the playing field um, in terms of who shows up in fundamental data sets, whose experiences are represented there. A lot of what we hear about with large language models, which are the foundation of many generative AI tools, is this idea that they are they're based on the entire internet, um, which sounds terrific, except the entire internet is not necessarily reflective of the true breadth and depth of the human experience especially when we think about smaller or more marginalized populations like those that many of the panelists and, then, and everyone attending this call are thinking about day in and day out. Um, and so it's part of why I think the, as I said a minute ago, starting to get workers and learners individually to share their own experiences, to, to work with these AI tools, to be able to pressure test them for the way in which they are or, or are not benefiting use cases or, or other uses to which they want to put those tools is gonna to be really essential um, because we all know that more diverse populations that are engaging with technology ask different questions, right? Just as Dr. Rice said, you know, an engineer might be building the tool, but they need to get the specifications from the people who are gonna be working on them, um, which means that you need to really capture a full range of human experience. Um, and as we are continuing to mine that data from elsewhere out in the world, in some cases create it, whether synthetically, because the, there's a real hunger for data that isn't necessarily being, you know, created by the actual world more quickly, you know, or quickly enough. And so AI is, is creating its own data sets to then apply to AI, which um, confuses me very quickly, but it, it's clearly happening. Um, or, you know, when our, our 
developers of technology actively reaching out to communities. You know, I do think we see some examples of this in AI for voice technology, um, which are things like voice recognition software, um, you know, a, a tool like Alexa, for example, that hears you speak, understands what you say, and then can respond to you. Um, we know that some of those tools just, you know, as they've been developed over time, um, don't do as good a job of understanding, you know, particular dialects, non-English languages, for example. Um, and so in some cases, the, the solutions that are proposed are we just need more human beings who speak in different ways or speak different languages to record their voices um, so that these tools can get a better understanding of, of what, what people from all walks of life and all backgrounds sound like, the words that they use, the way those words sounds and how, you know, machines or an AI can understand that language. Um, which is fascinating to me, um, raises all kinds of other questions about then who owns that data that they then generate, who benefits from it, do the, the people who contribute that data continue to benefit from it. Um, this question of, of long-term data ownership, I think is going to be one of the really signal ones of the AI age, um, and one that can potentially either contribute to um, or potentially help ameliorate this new form of AI digital divide. So I don't, I don't think the space has anywhere near figured it out yet. Um, but the more I think that all of us that are, are practitioners are working in this space start to get our arms around what are the data sets that are being used, you know, how are models being trained, starting to ask what might feel like really dumb questions, but there, there are no dumb questions in this space, um, so that we get a better understanding of, of whose data is being used how that data is being evaluated as best we can and what might be missing from some of those foundational data sets. Dr. Rice or Natalie, do you have any reactions to that or do you have any thoughts on maybe the, the ownership of, of this data and as it relates to com the communities that are contributing to it? Yeah, I, I guess I, I think about data in a, in a couple of different ways. One is I think about data that's being collected in the context of, um, as I mentioned before, sort of social service delivery or medical services delivery and the ways in which those data are being used um, to more and more are, are being used and are going to be used to drive AI systems. And I think with those data, oftentimes the owner is you know, the county of LA or the state of California or Kaiser Permanente or, you know, et cetera. And I think that we then also need to think about um, how are those entities being held accountable for issues around equity? And I think that we as a community, um, you know, need to be helping identify those, you know, what our concerns are. I mean, one of the things that we did in the project with LA Housing, you know, Service Authority was that we, as 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 I think you know maybe Alex suggested was we had you we worked with people who were individuals experiencing homelessness, and we worked with people who were case managers who provide housing services, and we worked with the people at. LASA and the Department of Mental Health, who are policymakers, because all of those different stakeholder groups have slightly different ideas about what needs to be taken into consideration. And all of those voices, I think, should be elevated in a part of the dialogue. And I think it's, you know, folks like us whose job it is to try to help make spaces for those voices and to elevate those voices. The other thing I think about is this issue about kind of the, the larger universe of data that's out there in the internet and to what extent that is a, you know, a public versus a private owned space, right? I mean, there's a lot of data that we all give away to corporate entities very thoughtlessly, and they know an enormous amount about us and it basically have the, the right to do with pretty much whatever they want with that data because of the way that we sign away our use agreements. Like, the amount of information that Google knows about you because of the emails that you send back and forth and the things that you look for on Google and the way that those things are linked in their back end, they know so much about you. It would terrify you if you actually started to think about the way that these analytic methods can actually you know, guess at what you're going to do. 
Are they doing anything nefarious with it? No. Are we lucky that Google is a fairly benign organization? Yes. Um, but you know, people make a lot of decisions about, I want to use this product. I want to be on Twi on TikTok. I want to be on Instagram. Go ahead and, and then click accept for the use terms, right? And you have just given away all of your data forever. Like you don't own it, they do. And I don't think people really think about that. I think they think about like, this is my email. It's not your email, it's Google's email. Um, and that's a fundamental reality. Um, I also think with the generative AI stuff, you know, I find it a little bit troubling that the internet is the source of the, of the learning because the internet is such a biased universe, right? The internet is a very white, very um, literate universe. Even the fact that there's an enormous amount of text that has been generated prior to the creation of the internet that has all been uploaded to the internet just reinforces how white and literate and English speaking, frankly, the, the the sort of the corpus of data that is that is there is. And so even when we're thinking about, oh, it might be a great way to elevate communities where people like struggle with, you know, good syntax and grammar. But it's like if you ask ChatGPT to generate a letter, a, a paragraph about a topic for you, are you even literate enough to read what it's given you to know that it's given you a sensible answer? Like it might be grammatic, it will be grammatically correct, but is it content wise correct? And how do we help communities who have been historically disadvantaged by these, by, you know, uh, you know, poor education systems that are having the greatest difficulties, you know, really having a, a, a meaningful level of literacy not be further pushed behind as those who are have a functional level of literacy are then accelerated in their literacy by these tools. And those who don't have a functional level of literacy are buried, especially when you think about like you add in the notion of prompt engineering, like, I don't know how many of you played around with chat GPT, but if you don't start to ask it the right sorts of questions and, and kind of groom it to toward what you're trying to get it to do, it does pretty dumb things, right? Because it just, it gives you literally what you ask it to give you, because that's the way computer programs work. But, you know, the, the more sophisticated and literate you are, the more you can get it to give you something sophisticated and literate. So I feel like this is a force multiplier for people that have a baseline level of literacy. And that's one of the huge social divides in our society and in most industrialized societies. And so I really worry about the way that this is going to polarize um, uh, human capital in a very meaningful way. And so I'm really glad that, you know, there are groups, you know, like, like JFF that where you're really thinking this through because I, it scares the, it scares the crap out of me. Um, so, you know, probably you too, but uh, so there's a bunch of alarmist things all in five minutes or less. So there you go. I'll just add, I think in terms of data and the work that we see, you know, there's a lot of once in a generation funding coming down to access the internet. And we're talking about who has access to opportunities like using AI and, and the literacy and devices that go along with it. Um, but I think in terms of, of the data set, the policy standpoint is also catching up to it. We're seeing the FCC bring out NPRMs around digital discrimination, asking for public comments on how to define that, and then also net neutrality. Um, we're also seeing that the White House published a blueprint around AI and what does that look like? And the algorithmic discrimination is at the top of, of that list as well. So I think it's just a matter of time for um, the policy to catch up to where the technology is. It'll take some time, but I think that's where community, you know, is really on the rise and looking at this from a standpoint of, of equity. Um, that's just exactly what we did when it came to the middle mile maps, the federal funding accounts, these priority maps that dictate a huge amount of funding and communities like South LA, the Sela areas in LA County, um, often get left behind. And the data that the, these maps are pulling from comes from the California Public Utilities Commission, which that data is being sent to by the internet providers who are the ones in charge of where these also dollars are getting funded. So it's also a matter of questioning the, the actual data and then also providing, um, you know, looking at a community standpoint of how can you mobilize partners to do the research and uh, provide that community voice we did at CCF um, a price disparities report that looked at promotional packaging 
data sets of what um, what communities are being offered the best prices. And it's no shocker that Beverly Hills are getting charged a better um, promotional package when it comes to internet versus South LA and communities in the Sella area. Um, so I think in, in that regard, it kind of just um, was a domino effect and more communities started looking at that report. And then it also increased awareness around how do we re replicate that report to look at our promotional packaging because the data that we see on our state utilities commission is not accurate of what we are experiencing. Um, so I think just questioning it and then also looking at it from a policy standpoint of what policies can be in place to call out um, the, the visual discrimination and algorithmic discrimination. Thank you, Natalie. And that, that actually uh, leads us to the, to the next question, which is, um, you know, what can folks do to be a part of this responsible development of AI as a, as a technology and a solution for all? You know, how, how do the folks in the room today, and we know we have, we have colleges represented, we have you know, faculty and students, uh, we have nonprofits who are doing the work on the ground to work towards digital equity. We have foundations. How do we move together um, as organizations and as communities from a place of, of uncertainty and, and weariness um, to, to feeling empowered um, to use AI to, to bridge the digital divide? What are some, what are some things that, that folks can do or as a next step? I'm happy to start. I think some, and this gets back to this idea that especially, well, two things. One, that especially generative AI is so accessible. And as we heard Dr. Rice talk through in his presentation, there is so much use of AI that's already baked into the cake in so many different ways um, that th really two things I think are foundational for me. One um, is to get training where you can. And a lot of the organizations on this call um, are, ha you know, have a possibility um, to offer that up or to, to host it themselves or to take advantage of it where it's being created. There's, there's so much content out there um, on foundational literacy around AI in particular. Um, we're doing some thinking about what it looks like to, to bring that, that kind of training and literacy support to the populations that we serve. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a technology and a set of solutions that are going to evolve over time. And so the more that all of us can get as solid an understanding as we can about what the technology is, how it might evolve in the future, and what we need to be looking out for is step one. And step two is use it. Um, because it is in all of our hands, I think that creates opportunities for all of us to experiment, to test it out, um, to try to, to Dr. Rice's point earlier, to try to get it to do the things that we need it to do or want it to do, um, and to make our voices heard, both when we see it work really well and when we see it having potential challenges. Because I think one of the things that is always terrific about working with technologists and engineers is the spirit of constant innovation, ongoing change, you know, the technology can always get better. And it has progressed so far, certainly in the many decades that AI has been under development. And absolutely in the last year since ChatGPT exploded onto the scene. Um, so that th those improvements are happening as we speak, but we all, we have to make sure that we all have seats at the table um, to, to press for ensuring that the technology is serving all of us and all of the communities that we serve. So we are big advocates of that, you know, basic understanding of what AI, AI is and how it can be used that's independent of any one tool, but that thinks about the technology itself. Um, and experimentation, you know, within organizations, it may be helpful to put some guardrails around it, you know, to think about use it to make your emails better, use it to summarize meeting, you know, notes that you can think about a million different ways that you can engage. But the more you play around with it, the more you will get an understanding of what it does really well today, what it maybe is still growing towards, um, and have many, many more ideas, I think, than you would if you hadn't experimented with it a little bit on your own. Dr. Rice, did you want to follow up on that? I was going to pass it to Natalie first, but um, but you no, know, you no, know, Natalie, you're you're much more engaged in sort of community active activism, you know, and advocacy than 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 I am as a researcher. So I, please, yeah, I would say I think um, there's tons of organizations. You know, Digital Equity LA Coalition is an organization that is really unique in the sense that 
none of our organizations focus on solely digital equity, but we know that digital equity is the intersection to access so many services from healthcare, education, immigration, housing. Um, so I think the same lens applying to AI and not just thinking it in from a standpoint of um, you know, chat GBT and these machines and all of that, but I think just thinking it from the lens of an equity standpoint of who has access to AI and how does it dictate everyday life. Um, and I think having these conversations and asking questions is really valuable. Um, you know, none of our partners are experts in, in digital equity, but they know what community is and they know what community stands for and the importance of having community at the table. Um, so I would just encourage folks to have conversations with the folks that in your community that, that you serve um, around AI and what they know and maybe what you can also learn. Um, there's something more powerful than knowledge. So I think just having conversations in general is, is the first step. Thank you, Natalie and Alex uh, for that. Um, so we're coming up on the end of the discussion portion um, and moving into Q&A. Uh, we had some folks submit some questions ahead of time. So we'll kick off with one of those, but I wanna invite all of the um, attendees today uh, to submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, um, rather than the chat. If you've, if you've already dropped a question in the chat, we'll move it into the Q&A um, feature as well. So I'll make sure to, you know, to capture those, um, but let's kick off with uh, one of the questions that had been submitted during registration around um, how to, how might uh, we, <laughs> this is a big one, um, navigate the ethical gray areas uh, of data usage in AI with, with our students. So Dr. Rice, that might be something that you wanna chat a bit about. Oh gosh, yeah, AI, AI and students, oh boy. Um, you know, I think th there, it's, it's interesting, there's been, there's been a, at least at the university level, there's been a, a big discussion in the last year about, you know, how especially chat GPT is impacting the way that students may, you know, respond to essay assignments and 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 the like. And I think um, it is, I think we're we are going to need to figure out how to think about chat GPT as a tool and not just assume that it's plagiarism. I mean, one of the thoughts that I had um, at one point was, you know, at some point, you know, we learned how to do square roots in like in, in high school math because that was something that we needed to learn how to do. And it's like this very long, cumbersome thing that you do. But if you have like a calculator, you just press a button and it does it for you, right? Like, so to a certain extent, like, you know, I think that, chat GPT may be like, like a scientific calculator for writing, right? Like it's not going to think for us, it, but it is going to help us do the mechanical aspects of writing faster and easier the same way that like a scientific calculator helps you to do the mechanical aspects of math. Does that mean that math is no longer a relevant subject? No, not at all. I mean, math is probably one of the most relevant subjects that you learn in, in, in school. Um, because it's, it's learning about how to think logically, it's learning how to think in systems, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that, so what does this mean for us in the, in the short run? We're like running around like chickens with our heads cut off, right, is what it means in the short term. I think we will start to figure out what the ethical use of this technology is. Um, I mean, at this point, I think that there's a lot of sort of decisions about you know, you are not allowed to use ChatGPT in answering this question, or you are allowed to use ChatGPT in answering this question. You just have to let me know that you used ChatGPT in answering this question. I think the latter is probably more how we're going to have to think about, you know, this moving forward. But then also, there are still a high level of literacy that a person needs to have in order to understand whether or not what it gave you is what you wanted it to give you. And it actually answers the question in a meaningful way. I mean, I've asked ChatGPT to generate some stuff for me in the past, and it's pretty vacuous. But I mean, it's like sometimes, though, the it gives me a, a fluffy outlines of something that I could then say, oh, as a literate person, I can now take this and recraft it. So I think that it's... um. Uh, I think that I don't know that there's a simple answer to what is the ethical use of these technologies for students yet, although I think as with many things 
you know, it's about, you know, giving credit where credit is due, right? So I think what's unethical is to pretend that it was something that you did by yourself when it was in fact something that you had this technology help you with. I mean, it's sort of like taking a math test and your, you know, your your, your math teacher tells you like, you're allowed to use a calculator for this exam or you're not allowed to use a calculator for this exam, that kind of, you know, I mean, I know that's a really dumb analogy, but I, I think it's, you know, for me, at least it kind of helps me as a, as a, you know, what is, what is this about kind of thing? Um, so, um, and here's a fun collection of classroom level AI policies. All right, I'm glad that uh, that uh, Rachel Riggs has has done has done has done their homework. Um, uh, so, the, yeah. So this is this is a huge emerging dialogue within education for sure. Thank you, Dr. Rice. So another question that was dropped in the chat is focusing on one of the communities that uh, depends on technology to be integrated into society, um, which is you know folks with disabilities. What what are the workforce policies that are um, in place, you know, to, to consider them for future the future of jobs and AI? Alex, I think this is probably your Sure. I mean, I think some of it that we're we're thinking about questions like this now, um, vis-a-vis -vis a broader sort of AI-related policy agenda, especially when thinking about the future of work. So I th I think there are two ways to think about this question. One is um making sure that people with with all forms of disability um, have an equitable opportunity to pursue jobs in AI, right? Building AI solutions, being part of that community. Um, and the other way of thinking about it is making sure how might AI enabled tools help expand or strengthen training or support or creation of access for people um, with disabilities for all other forms of jobs. Um, and I think we, we are trying to keep both of those lenses front and center um, when we're thinking about AI writ large. Um, I think the the first one, you know, is is very akin to a lot of the work that's that is happening and needs to continue to happen um, to make sure that training pathways into jobs um, are truly equitable and accessible, that we ask ourselves the right question about what are the skills and requirements that are needed to perform tasks. Um, you know, AI has, is very highly populated by PhDs and master's degrees and engineers and others. Um, but as we've seen with a lot of the rest of technology, I suspect that there's a world where a lot of those roles will increasingly be accessible without a bachelor's degree. And so what then does the training um, ecosystem look like that's supporting people for those roles? Um, a lot of our partners are, are moving really fast to ask themselves some of those same kinds of questions. Um, and so absolutely, we need to make sure that whether it's through you know, public policy, funding incentives, um, you know, specific set-asides, um, that we're ensuring that people with disabilities are, are at those tables um, to, when those opportunities are created. The other, from a use cases perspective, I think is, is really exciting. Um, I don't know that I have specific examples to share here, but it's something for us to continue to be on the lookout for, um, because the more that we can have technology that's driven by AI in ways that, um, you know, just can help be an assistive device, for instance. Um, we've seen a lot of explosion of technology on that front, um, whether it's in their devices or other things just in the last several years. And so to just to be able to keep our, our minds open to the possibility that there may be um, ways in which AI can help lead to greater assistive technologies for people with disabilities is really, really exciting. Um, but the same idea applies, right? We need people with disabilities and those who work with those communities to be at the table when, when these kinds of technologies are developed um, so that they are not left behind when we're thinking about the broad ecosystem um, of AI-enabled technologies um, and preparation for AI jobs, but also so that when there is a brilliant idea for a use case that can be especially powerful for people with disabilities, whether it's connecting to them to the workforce or just supportive services or anything else, um, that those use cases are uncovered and developed more fully and representation is really going to matter for that. It's a great question. Thank you, Alex. Um, so I'm seeing a kind of a grouping of questions that have come in both in this live event and and uh, earlier on um, during the registration process around digital literacy. And we know it's a huge component of, of achieving digital equity, uh, but are there any good models or tools or have you seen anybody do a great job of integrating AI into their existing kind of digital skills trainings that you could recommend um, to organizations here? That question has come, come in from a few different 
angles, but it's all, you know, addressing you know, where can we look to prepare our communities um, for having to, to exist with AI. And that's that's open <laughs> to whoever wants to pick it up. If you've come across anything, maybe, um, yeah, or nonprofits that are that are doing digital skills training, maybe from um, your on the ground work that we would want to highlight and and have these conversations with. I know we have a great partner, everyone on, who does a lot of community work in Los Angeles um, with digital navigator programs, and so um, I imagine that this is a, probably a conversation that they're having as well on the ground. If, if folks haven't heard of them before, they're doing amazing work. I can jump in just very quickly. Um, I think there are a ton of examples here, including some of the, the technology companies, whether it's our friends from Microsoft who are on the call today. Um, Google Intel um, has a really innovative program um, with community colleges around the country that thinks about the idea of foundational AI literacy for all jobs, not just technology jobs. Um, there are a lot of these kinds of resources and there will be more and more probably by the day. Um, I think IBM too, there, there are lots of these instances. And so I would say, um, look to the developers of AI technology um, because they are very, very well positioned to help the world understand how those technologies can be used. Um, there are a lot of really, really innovative training providers that are thinking about these kinds of questions. Um, CodePath is one great example that we've been watching um, that helps support um, people into careers in technology. Um, they're racing to think about this. Um, there, are, there are a ton, and I think we'll see more and more every day, um, of the sort of leading national players in these kinds of non-bachelor's degree training opportunities. Um, Miami-Dade College is another example um, that I was just talking to them yesterday. Um, they're developing both a suite of credentials, but also associate and bachelor's degrees in, in AI. Um, these are just a few, and it is by no means a comprehensive study. But I think a lot of where, like what has been essential in, in developing those kinds of programs is an openness to experimentation, to recognizing that these kinds of skills are going to be essential for all workers. Not It's not just about your computer science students. It's really about everybody. Um, and maybe differentiated offerings, right? Your computer scientists, um, you know, future computer scientists that are looking for jobs building AI tools will need one set of trainings and solutions and others will need others. Um, and, you know, the, I think there are some companies out there, none come to mind uh, right this minute, but I've seen stories out there of companies that will you know, shut down the company for a day and do an AI hackathon, right? To allow their workforce to, with some guardrails, experiment with generative AI technology um, with business cases in mind. Again, I think it's I think it's about fundamental literacy and experimentation. And the more that um, employers, workforce entities, education, training providers can do to create opportunities for people to really get their hands on the technology, to see how they might use it in their own lives, um, you would, we, and we see this every single day in our work with technology, it is unbelievable to do when technology is in their hands. And so I, I think that's a wave that we can continue to follow and capitalize on as best we can. And I'll just add, um, from a community standpoint, we do have partners in our coalition that are great and have access to digital skills training and, and various programs that support this area. Um, you know, everyone on that I saw that in, in the chat is part of our coalition. Uh, Human IT is another great organization that does the work um, in the digital skills training. Um, and then in terms of research, I would say to look to folks um, at the Green Lining Institute. They've pu published some great reports around community and, um, and how algorithmic discrimination impacts everyday life, but also point to Center for Accessible Technology. They're another great partner of ours that's part of, of the coalition. Um, that has also done some great reports as, as well. So we kind of do a, a balance between um, education and, and some research, and then also organizations that have programs that are accessible. Thank you, Natalie. And if folks are in the room um, in the chat and do have programs that they know of, you know, feel free to share them. I've seen some links um, and other resources being shared. So I, I highly encourage you all to continue to do that um, while we, you know, progress through the Q and A. Um, I did see a comment in there about uh, a policy um, at the at the state level 
um, that is intended to address bias and discrimination in AI. And I think that's something we didn't get to touch upon too much earlier in the conversation. I think, Natalie, you did bring up um, the policy component to all of this. But I'm curious um, for, for, for the entire panel, you know, what are your thoughts on the, the current state of policy or the future of what, what we'll need for guardrails, if any? Um, how are you thinking about all of that? Uh, um, we can maybe start with Eric. Wow, that's a big one. Um, you know, I think I think that the policy space, as would be indicative by some of the things coming out from the White House and some of the things coming out from the you know European Union, like we don't we this is we are as a as a global society we are figuring this out. I think that there's a need, and I think that you know Microsoft is one of these groups i think partly because bill gates himself has been someone who's been you know pretty concerned about you know what the ramifications of ai are like you know we need to figure out what those guardrails should be um i think we will need to have policies in place that insist on some sort of i don't know that we can we can ask for for a universe in which bias and fairness are always guaranteed. I don't know that that's possible, but maybe we need to be asking that these things are at least interrogated for and and are thought through and that we think about how we want to in you know what sorts of what sorts of bias around what kinds of groups and 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 that we we are asking for, you know, responsible deployment of these, you know, and development of these technologies. I think um you know, just like we insist on, you know, legality around access, you know, in, in other aspects of, you know, socially provided goods. And, and we want to make sure that, you know, like, and we want, for example, like, you know, housing, housing, there are anti-discrimination laws in place to prevent things that used to historically happen, like redlining. We need to be thinking about what is the next frontier of preventing the digital redlining you know right and 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 i think you know and and these things happen in very subtle ways because we have i don't know that we've we have we've yet figured out for example like you know credit scores and how those are calculated and how that may be also you know mining information that may have racial bias etc and you know and and thinking about the ways in which corporate entities are also on the hook for behaving in ways that we think are not just ethical but legal and not discriminatory um and and that's i think so it's good to see that there are these emerging thoughts about you know bills and and that, should, that you know i i don't know exactly i'm i'm not an ethicist nor am i a lawyer you know i'm i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a social work professor who worries about homelessness right so so these are so my perspective is that i'm very concerned about these things and i think that we need to have policies that are sensitive to these emerging issues i don't know exactly what those things should be um but they have to incorporate equity in the way that we think about it around other issues i think um in our law thank you dr ray um, yeah, it was a big question, and I think you know folks will leave, <laughs> will leave here with even more questions. But I think it's great because this is the beginning of the conversation. Um, and Natalie, I know you had mentioned um, digital discrimination earlier in the FCC, and can you share a little bit about that and just kind of the definition of that and how that's evolving? Yeah, and, and Dr. Rice kind of said, you know, the redlining aspect, and there is um, such thing as digital redlining, and we, we know that from the standpoint of various data sets. Um, one, one instance I will share is that we looked at LA County maps around the COVID hotspots, civic deserts, food deserts, housing, all of the things um, that also layered with access to broadband. And when you layer all of these maps, all of the same spots lit up. Um, which we know that access to broadband in certain communities throughout the county um, are disadvantaged proportionally to wealthier neighborhoods. Um, so digital redlining is very real in LA County. We also know one in four households don't have um, proper internet access. And so when we talk about policy standpoints that address these, I think um, the biggest one obviously is FCC digital discrimination. 
And the biggest component of, of that NPRM is the intent versus impact. And how can we prove that the intent um, and, and impact and what is the actual difference between that of providers don't have the intent to discriminate, but their practices of their market research, the data that they use has serious impact discrimination and outcomes. Um, so that is kind of the task that we are tasked with right now. And, um, and the coalition is really unfolding what that looks like in litigation and bringing comments up to the FCC to really assess um, that in, intent versus impact of how, do, how, does, how does one define digital discrimination, whether that's from a consumer standpoint or from a provider standpoint. Um, there's so many layers to that NPRM. It's a quite a large document. It's like 60 pages. So, um, but I think that, that those are the biggest highlights from that is really looking at that. And then also net neutrality has come up um, that it's gonna be addressed in the FCC this year as, as well. Um, that's from a federal level. And then from a California level, there's tons of proceedings at the California Public Utilities Commission that we are also working on that address various topics from service quality standards to large amounts of these dollars coming down the pipeline from BEAD, um, from the California Advanced Service Fund. There's a whole bunch of proceedings that we are active on to making sure that community voice is at those, those tables when it comes to the policy standpoint. And then most recently, um, we also supported um, legislation at the state level to look at mapping and where does broadband mapping tools support um, because we know that ISPs provide that data. So um, we're kind of on every level from a federal standpoint and a, and a state level looking at advocacy, ad advocacy from a digital equity lens, um, but it's an ongoing struggle. You know, we know that providers have the resources and the lobbyists to do this, this work. It's really left to communities that have, um, that are left behind that are left to do this, this work. Um, but we're, we're, we're moving along and we're still working. So if you have questions around the coalition, um, I'll drop my email in the chat as well. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, and folks, if, if you want to follow along with the digital discrimination um, proceedings at the FCC, we're happy to share some of that information afterwards as well. We have a, a great partner um, at the FCC, Sanford Williams, who um, has been deeply in, entrenched in community and, and having these conversations with and gathering the stories of people's lived experiences um, with digital discrimination. So if that's something that you're interested in following up on, we're happy to make that connection as well. Uh, but Alex, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share a bit about how policy has intersected with your work or how, how you're thinking about um, it as a guardrail in the future. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think a, a lot of the first steps in this is to make sure that the policy conversation is inclusive of the impacts on workers and learners. Um, because that is that's sort of the, the lens that we use to think about all of this, um, especially through the perspective of of what will enable and unlock um, economic equity. So in many ways, you know, the the policy conversation, especially at the federal level, is just now getting started. Um, when we think about the implications for the workforce um, at both the federal level, at the state level as well, we're seeing a lot of questions start to pop up. Um, a lot of sort of study commissions being established. Um, and not necessarily as many specific policy recommendations. So that's something that we're eager to, to dive in on specifically. Um, I think there are some things that are broadly speaking good ideas when it comes to education and workforce policy that will continue to be good ideas um, when you think about their application in AI. So some examples of that include support for earn and learn models, like the apprenticeship model, for instance, when we think about how we can better train people for jobs um, obviously, that as many folks on the call will likely know, um, that system is thought of as being um, really belonging to the skilled trades. Um, but we've seen a real explosion of interest in apprenticeship models being used to train people for careers in technology. And so to think about what it would look like to apply those to jobs, building AI tools, for instance, is a really exciting opportunity. Um, to think about um, all of the different ways that we can finance people's educational pathways. It's a big question that we dig into quite a lot at JFF. Um, and, you know, I think all of those questions are applicable in the case of AI as well. Um, the other one that's starting to come to the forefront for us is how we support workers in times of transition. Um, our, our worker and workforce safety net in this country um, is in some ways very strong, but also in some ways, you know, could, could use a little bit of, of continued um, strengthening and repair, um, especially thinking about the kinds of, of causes or moments that might lead someone to be without a job um, or to, to, be, to find themselves in a scenario where their job is evolving. 
a lot of what I think you'll hear and see us advocating for in the coming months, um, especially on the strength of the research that I spoke about at the beginning of the call, um, is the idea of, of reshaping and transforming jobs over time um, rather than making wholesale shifts to workforce. We know that that's how jobs actually evolve in practice, often in response to the development of new technologies. And a lot of the research that we've seen out in the world essentially suggests as though the, the implications of AI for workers will be like flipping on a light switch. You know, we'll wake, we'll wake up one morning and jobs will have vanished or jobs will have emerged. And while that certainly does happen from time to time, um, what we see much more commonly in really when any form of technology is introduced into the workforce um, is the jobs shift over time as business needs change, as workers themselves and their teams start to understand what it looks like to integrate new technologies. Um, and so the more that we can, you know, at the federal level, at the state level, continue to support everybody involved in that ecosystem, whether it's workers themselves, whether it's employers, especially small businesses that may not always have as much of the wherewithal as a large enterprise would have to adopt these kinds of technology to support their workers in navigating them. Um, workforce entities, training providers, really everybody that has a role to play in training the workforce of the future um, and supporting people that are holding jobs today to think about this in terms of an evolution where people are reskilled or upskilled and can remain either in their job or in a future version of their job and have the opportunities for growth and development that come with those transformations. That's really exciting. And so we're on the lookout for um, policy ideas and recommendations that can help support that kind of a shift, whether that is you know, support for lifelong learning, knowing you know, in recognition of the fact that all of us will need to come in and out of learning environments over the course of our careers as we upskill and reskill ourselves or or are supported to do so by our employers. Um, you know, creating the kinds of supports that might help um, employers navigate some of these kinds of transitions as well as others in the space. I think there's a lot of really fertile ground for policy um, that both puts guardrails in place when we need it to, but also incentivizes the kind of behavior that we hope to see across the economy in a way that continues to center humans and human workers um, and, and unlock the potential of human beings, even as this wave of AI transformation starts to crest. Thank you, Alex. Um, I wanted to highlight a comment that was made in the chat a little bit earlier, and then I think we'll be wrapping up soon. But um, I think Jael or Hayal, um, had mentioned uh, struggling to, to understand the relevance of AI for older folks who occupy low wage industries and whose interaction with technologies may be limited. Um, and I think we've touched upon it throughout the conversation, the idea that it, the people who are making decisions that impact our lives are using tools that use data that is maybe not equitable. And so even if you're not using the technology directly, not being represented in the data is going to affect your life in some way. And to summarize my understanding of it, um, and I, I want to get your thoughts on that maybe as like a closing, like how when people leave here today, what do you want them to understand about AI in their lives that they can carry forward to their communities? Like how, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So whatever whatever you wanna share in part as your final kind of remarks. Um, and then I'll pick Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's interesting because AI doesn't, you know, directly come up in the work that I do with community, but it does have serious implications um, and the consequences and the outcomes part of it is kind of what, what we look at. But I think looking at it from a community standpoint of um, asking questions, you know, there is no wrong question, I think. Um, this, no one is, this is a very new area for a, lo a lot of people, including community. So I think asking questions to, to folks, um, joining coalitions, looking to partners and organizations that are in this work, looking to research, there's so much out there. Um, and I think just finding resources in community that can point you in the right direction of kind of where to start. Um, I know when I first got on board to the digital equity space, there's just so much information to know, just the terminology alone is overwhelming. Um, so I think just coming into it with just knowing that everyone is still learning, there's something always changing in the world of, of digital equity and just like AI, there's something new. Um, so I think just coming in from, from a lens of everyone is still learning um, and asking questions around this is really helpful for, um, for 
least for myself and community, <laughs> but would um, use that as my last talking point. Uh, Dr. Rice. Um... Sure, sure. Thanks. It, this has been such a, 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 a an interesting conversation to be a part of, and, and I've really in, enjoyed the, the the morning and the opportunity to share some of the work that I've done, and also just some of my crazy, uh, you know, not conspiracy theory, but genuinely concerned about the state of the world thoughts. Um, I think, you know, I kind of end maybe with another sort of genuinely concerned about the state of the world thought with this topic, which is that I think we underestimate sometimes how much low wage industry work is impacted by technology. I mean, the service sector has become the real, you know, sort of bedrock of low wage work these days. But yet I've noticed recently increasingly the sort of the the um, jo those jobs being replaced by technological solutions. You know, you go into a drugstore or a grocery store these days and the self checkout is much, you know, is a much longer line than the than the clerk's uh, position was. You know, there's a big corporate motive to replace human beings with technology because human beings are, uh, you know, a, an expense that is that is you know greater usually um, than technology is at least in the in the in the medium you know and longer term, and I think that um, we're also seeing the emergence of a lot of gig work. You know, the 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 Postmates and all you know and all that stuff and those are becoming sort of the new space in which people who are part of the service sector economy who don't have a really stable position in the workforce are being are being funneled to those are very technology you know fueled working spaces and so i think that we really need to think about in the future of work not just well, what does chat GPT mean? But what is just generally like these, you know, this sort of increase in all of these very much AI driven technologies in general, but, you know, if we can source, if we can crowdsource this ch cheaper, then we can have people working in brick and mortar spaces for it, which is oftentimes the case, then we're creating more people that have a very tenuous relationship to the job market. And how do we support those people? Um, I think this is something that I worry about a lot. Um, and I don't know what legislation needs to be enacted in order to do this because, you know, the corporate motive for decentralizing and and disinvesting in the workforce is huge. And, the you know, and that is a force that we need to reckon with as we're trying to help empower people. Thank you, Dr. Rice and Alex. I'm gonna just close us out. <laughs> yeah, I think the the most important thing to to end with is what it looks like for us to center humans in this new future. My my real hope, and I'm optimistic about this, is that the power of AI technology, as well as all of these really critical questions about what it looks like to apply it equitably, can actually lead us to ask different questions than we have been able to before about what work is uniquely human work versus what work can actually be done and potentially should be done by machines, because that will free up the time and the capabilities and the talents that only human beings bring. Ju what gets really exciting to me about a future like that is let's think about how we can newly invest in caregiving work in educational work, in so much work that, you know, the work of team leaders and others who are investing day in and day out in supporting other human beings, contributing to growth and development, but too often that work is undervalued. If AI creates opportunities for us to say, there is work that, that only humans can do or that AI can uplift and enable humans to do even better, and what does that look like and how do we value that? Um, we have to ask the questions in that way, but I, I think the world is, becomes a, a really, really extraordinary place when we can. Thank you, Alex, and, and thank you to all of our panelists today for engaging in this discussion and you know, bringing up some really big questions that will bring up more questions when folks go home uh, today and you know, back to their teams. And hopefully, um, you know, this is a starting point uh, for under, better understanding the relationship of AI and and your work on the ground and if we can be a resource 
to furthering that, then, you know, our organization is always happy to connect. And I think the folks on the call um, presenting today as well. So, yeah, and if some contact information was shared earlier, if, if you all feel comfortable sharing it in the chat, you know, feel free to drop it. And thank you to everyone again um, for, for working towards equity for, for all um, in this space. So, great day.